Uh, let's cross to Peter Squires, who's Professor of Criminology and Public Policy at the University of Brighton here in the UK, and he joins me now. Uh, Peter, I don't know if you uh, could hear what our, our last guest was saying. He was basically saying that, um, you know, more stringent gun laws do not make a safer society. What do you say to that? I think that's clearly wrong. I don't think he knows the, the detail and he's probably not studied the uh, national profiles. Um, Australia made a significant change to its gun laws after Port Arthur in 1996 and saw a significant drop off in, in uh, fatal uh, gun homicide attacks. And, and we have done the same. And for the period since around 2002, we've seen a year on year decrease in the number of um, Gun in gun enabled uh, crimes. It's it's ticked up in the last two years. I think partly as a result of issues to do with urban policing uh, and the whole austerity agenda. But across the world, inequality and and an excess of firearms leads to more death and more misery and and also more suicide. That that's often overlooked. I know that you're taking part in a conference next week discussing the increase in gun ownership. Do you think anything is going to change as a result of this latest mass shooting in Las Vegas? Um, probably not. Uh, and I think that's the unfortunate fact. I, I, I imagine that everyone remembers the, the Sandy Hook case when when 20 primary school children were shot uh, by, a, by a, a, a mentally... Uh, deranged uh, character. That could have been the game changer. President Obama put some significant political capital behind the attempt to change the, the gun laws, in, in federal gun laws in the states, and, and was blocked in the Senate by uh, NRA-supported Republican opposition. So if, if the murder of children can't make the difference, I, I, I'm, I'd be surprised if there is the kind of long-term political traction to get change on in this particular case, mm. the, the, the kinds I mean, of proposals in this necessary... case, uh, it's, uh, I was going to say that, that those who support the right to carry say that, you know, there are enough checks and balances in place. But in this case, uh, this man had no priors. He didn't appear on uh, any watch list. He was able to get hold of dozens of weapons legally. So how do you stop someone like that? And that was the point I was going on to say. I mean, because America, you can buy guns. He was a legal gun owner uh, and he purchased, he accumulated his gun stock over a number of years. America has no gun registry. It doesn't have a licensing system. So you can accumulate a, a large supply of, of firearms. There is a background check system. If you, if you go to a federally licensed firearms dealer, you have to be checked. You, your criminal record, your mental health, and in, in some states, a more, um, a more searching inquiry is made into your suitability to own a gun. But if you, if you leave that gun shop with a nicely boxed up handgun, you can sell it in the car park of the gun shop the same day, subject to no checks at all. So the problem is not just the gaps in the background check system, it's the unlicensed secondary market, which accounts for something like 35 to 40 percent of gun sales, completely off the radar. And that's how people can stockpile these little arsenals. Peter, thank you very much indeed for that. Peter Squires there at Brighton University.